Congregation, we can turn again in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. I'd like to read verses 3 through 6. Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul has recounted what Christ has done. And now in chapter 4, it begins with that, Therefore, because of what Christ has done for you, therefore. And verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord... One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Masks, lockdowns, vaccines. Those have been Satan's surprising weapons that he has used to try and create Fractures and blow up the church over the past year and a half. Those weapons on the surface don't seem like much. What is a mask? What is a lockdown? What's a vaccine? And yet, at different points and in different places, it seems that his strategy has been effective. As we look around the church in general, we can see a lot of rubble. It looks something like an air raid has occurred and bombs have been dropped on the church and there's lots of damage. Uh, And and the dust clouds are still rising as this battle continues. And we're unsure of when the next barrage might come. We know that it hasn't been pretty for the church. And yet, amazingly, through this whole season, week after week, we have confessed I believe in the communion of the saints. And saying that, we are saying, I believe in the fellowship of the family of God. I believe in the tight bond of believers. I believe in the communion of the saints. And with all of these attacks on the church, maybe you're wondering are these just words? Or is this reality? Is there really such a thing as the communion of the saints? Well, if you struggle with that, then you need to realize that we are in a similar situation to what Paul was in 2,000 years ago when he was writing to the Ephesians uh, in this letter. The Ephesian church was threatened by that exact same thing, by division. Now, of course, Satan was using different tactics at the time, But division was one of the major problems for this church. Uh, And if we know something of this church, we know that it was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And that might not seem like a big deal to us, but that was a major deal in the first century. Uh, The Jews were raised to look at Gentiles as dogs. as those who you should stay away from, as those who are unclean. And so in Ephesians 2, verse 15, as Paul is dealing with the Jews and the Gentiles in this one church, Ephesians 2, 15, Paul says, uh, he, he speaks of the enmity or the hostility that naturally at this time existed between Jews and Gentiles. Hostility, enmity, hatred, warfare. That's what the church was dealing with. That was the tense situation at this time. And in chapters 2, verses 11 to 22, Paul has been laboring to tell them what Christ has done to bring about peace. Christ has torn down that wall of separation, he has said, between Jew and Gentile. Uh, Christ alone has brought truth and reconciliation. And yet if you were to look at this church as Paul the pastor was, he wouldn't see peace And he didn't see unity. Now, our chapter that we read, 
just beyond what we read, chapter 4, verse 17, notice what Paul says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Don't do that anymore. So Paul is saying, up till now, you've been walking like the rest of the Gentiles, like the rest of the world has been walking. Paul's looking at the church, and he, he says they look just like the world. There's, there's no difference. Christ, what Christ has done in chapter 2, hasn't made a difference in their life. The peace that Christ has won for them isn't being enjoyed. And then he details what's going on in the verses that follow, especially, you see verse 25, how this manifests itself. He says, put away lying. Lying was happening. Put away lying, for we are members of one another. Verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Paul wouldn't need to say that if there wasn't unresolved anger in the church that people were festering over and allowing to continue. And verse 31 really summarizes the situation. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And so you see the hostility that Christ came to deal with in chapter 2 is obviously still evident in this church. There's bitterness, there's wrath, there's anger, there's clamor, there's evil speaking, there's malice, there's tearing down, there's destruction. And Paul is saying, because of what Christ has done, put it away. This is all the dirty laundry that's presently lying around in the church in Ephesus, and he says it needs to be cleaned up. Now, as Paul looks at this church, at this, this mess, all this dirty laundry, does that leave him hopeless? Does that leave him despairing? Has he given up on this lost cause, the thing called the church? Is he abandoning this sinking ship? Is he doubting the existence of the communion of the saints? Well, if you know this glorious epistle at all, then you know that this letter is not a depressing dirge, a mournful melody, a funeral song at the death of the church. But no, this letter is a triumphant ode. It's a song of victory a song of triumph of what Christ has done. Paul is filled with this confidence for the church because Christ has gained the victory. And we see that in our text as well, where he speaks of Christ first descending and then ascending, rising into heaven as the victorious Christ to give gifts and to care for his church. And so even in this tumultuous time, Paul firmly believes in the communion of the saints. And I hope you do as well. So that's what we want to look at this morning, the the communion of the saints. First, the unity of the saints, and then second, the diversity of the saints. The communion of the saints, first of all, the unity of the saints. I believe in the communion of the saints. As we said, when we confess that every Lord's Day, we are speaking about the close relationship that exists between God's people. And this relationship is not arbitrary. It's not trite. It's not flimsy. Uh, It's not based on something that's unstable. But it's built on the fact that every true child of God shares something in common. That's what's really behind the word communion. To share in common. They have in common with one another something. They're equally partakers of something. They're united by all having the same thing. And and what is that thing? Well, that's where we want to begin, the basis. What's the basis of this unity? What is that thing that we share in common? And if you listen to our catechism, it beautifully tells us what that is. First, that all and everyone who believes being members of Christ are in common partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. And so, simply put, that is the thing that every child of God, every Christian has in common. They have Christ in common. They share in him. They share in their blessed Savior. And that is exactly why Paul began this letter where he did, 
If you go back to chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, you notice how Paul continues to hit that same note. Here, church in Ephesus that is so divided, that is tearing each other apart, know what you have in common, and the thing you have in common is Christ. And you can go through it and just trace, in Christ, in Christ. How many times he says that in those first verses? Paul is presenting this to their mind at the get-go, at the start. Know what you have in common. And so he says in verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so that's the major thing that makes a Christian a Christian. It's his relationship or her relationship to Jesus Christ. They are in Christ. They are united to Christ. Christ is their head, and and they are a part of Christ's body. And so they're inseparable from Christ. This is the one thing that unites Christians together, but also separates Christians from this world. Uh, This world, if if you boil it all down and peel it all back, this is the fundamental difference. This world is in Adam. Unbelievers are in Adam and and represented by Adam in relationship with Adam and receiving from Adam all that Adam can give them, namely death, condemnation, hatred, sinful hearts. And yet the difference then with the Christian is that they are in Christ, represented by Christ, receiving from Christ all that he can give and all of his blessings. And notice that's what Paul says. The Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so he wants us to to begin by by thinking about these these amazing blessings that come through Christ. And so as we think about the church and as we think about the communion of the saints, the point we're making here is that we must begin with Christ. We must begin by, by marveling again at what we have, what we share in Christ. And Paul has traced that in those first verses of Ephesians. He speaks of redemption. He speaks of forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, that peace with God, that sanctification of the Spirit's work in us, the hope of glorification and eternal life. These are the rich gifts that the church has in common. They share in the person of Christ and they share in the blessings that Christ has won for them. And so just think of that. What a foundation. What a basis for unity. As you look around at at others who maybe have many differences than you, there's a lot you don't have in common, yet you have this in common. And you have it equally in common. Every child of God equally shares in Christ. There's not one that's more in Christ and one that's maybe only 50% in Christ, still working on it. No, every true Christian, everyone who's been born again by the Spirit of God is in Christ 100%, receiving all that Christ can give them. And that's our foundation then. And the amazing point of our text then, when you get to chapter 4, especially verses 4 through 6, Paul is saying that if you have Christ, then you have the triune God. You have the triune God. Notice that. Verse uh, 4, if you have Christ, then you have the spirit of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. There is one body and one spirit. You equally share in the Holy Spirit. Uh, The same spirit dwells in every child of God. And it's the spirit who who kindles our hearts' affections for one another. And and so it's it's this, this unity. We're to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And that spirit, he has added us to the one body of Christ. And so we have, if we have Christ, we have the spirit. If we have Christ, verse 5, we have the one Lord. That's Christ himself. We have the one Lord, one faith in that Christ. And one baptism which signifies our union in Christ. And if we have Christ, then verse 6, you also have the Father of Christ. One God and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 
And by bringing up the father, don't you see the family language that's used here? This is your unity. You are a family. You are a a member of the family of God if you're a Christian. You've been adopted into this family. And, And so what a firm foundation Christ is. The triune God, the glorious triune God from eternity is reaching out to sinners through the only mediator, through Jesus Christ, and welcoming them, bringing them into his family, into his fellowship. And as God does that, he brings them into fellowship with other sinners who've also tasted of that grace. And so what a firm foundation Christ is. This is, this is why Paul keeps stressing that one, that word one. Notice verse four, there's one body and one spirit and there's one hope and one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of all. You are one because there's one foundation, the triune God in, in Christ, the triune God reaching out through Christ to you. And so when I confess to believe in the communion of the saints, what am I doing? Well, if I'm confessing that knowingly with, with knowledge, then that means I'm looking at myself and every other person who has faith in Christ, and I am saying they are equally a part of Christ's body. They equally share in Christ. They have as many spiritual blessings that I have received, the same adoption that I have, they have. All of these things we have in common. And so what a confession. Children, when we go through the Apostles' Creed, recognize that this is a Christ-centered confession. When we speak about the communion of the saints, we're not firstly speaking about the saints, but we're speaking about Christ and all that the saints have in Christ. And so can you make this your confession? Can you say this in truth? Can you make this Christ-centered confession? Do you share in Christ? Do you believe in Christ? Do you have this faith that unites you to Christ and, and that has, by the Spirit's grace, removed you from Adam and placed you in Christ, being represented by him? Have you seen your own spiritual poverty and reached out that empty hand like a beggar to Christ saying, have mercy on me, like, like blind Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If that's what you're doing today, then you will hear the same response that Bartimaeus heard. Take heart. He's calling you. He's welcoming you. He's calling you to himself. He's calling you so that he might, might give his love to you. Well, here's the point we've been making. We cannot think, as we've said, about the communion of the saints without first thinking of Christ. He is the basis of our unity. And flowing from that, then, comes a call, comes the call that we find in our text, verse 3. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Endeavor to keep it. You have it in Christ Resting on the triune God, you have it, so endeavor to keep it. You don't need to manufacture it. You don't need to make it up, create it, but you have it. Here's Paul saying, I believe in the communion of the saints. The saints have it. This union, this unity, it's a certain reality, but the thing that we are called to do is to guard it, to be like soldiers who, who, who stand on guard and who fight when necessary, to keep Christ the central basis of our union and of our reason why we are joint together. We, we are soldiers who are looking to make sure that Christ stays the foundation and not other things, not peripheral things, not, not things that, that we might be tempted to make our foundation. Well, how do we do this? How do, we, how do we fight to keep Christ all in all in our fellowship together? Well, the only way to do that is to over and over repeat and reaffirm what our catechism says. Everyone who believes is a member of Christ, a partaker of Christ in all his riches. It's to repeat that, to, to, to bring that for, forefront in our minds. This is what we have in common 
This is the thing. My, my brothers and sisters, they equally share with me in Christ's sacrifice and in Christ's righteousness. He has died for them, and he has died for me. We are equally accepted by the Father, equally loved by the Father. And this is true of all the saints because we are saints in Christ. And if we keep this central by, by bringing this to mind, by saying this to ourselves, by reminding ourselves of this, by hearing this, by preaching the gospel, if we do that, then many other things will fall in place. This Christ-centered communion, it decimates pride and envy and jousting for higher rank and status within the church. Because if we are reminding ourselves, if we are remembering that we equally share in Christ, then, then I am one among equals. There's no social hierarchy here. There's not those who are more equal than me. No, we are one among equals in Christ. There is that unity. There's no social pyramid that we need to try to scale. But every single Christian is an undeserving recipient. When we remember this, we remember that we're not entitled to anything. Isn't that often why there's problems in the church? We feel entitled to things. We feel our rights need to be remembered. But we're not entitled to anything. We are a fellowship that's been formed by God's free grace. That's what Paul's been laboring to say for chapters 1 through 3. We're a fellowship that's been made by the grace of God. And we must know this about ourselves and rejoice in this. That we are those beggars. And, and, and we are beggars who have rebelled against the king. And yet that king has come on our behalf. He has left heaven on our behalf to suffer and to die and to go to the, uh, to the tomb, but then to rise again and to ascend into heaven to make us kings and queens in his kingdom. And, and it's when we're cognizant of that, remembering that, that that generates a spirit of thankfulness, a spirit where we recognize that no believer has drawn the short straw. No, no. All of us have received far more than we have ever deserved. And so we don't need to compete against our brothers or sisters because we all have won in Christ. And it's only when we remember what we have in Christ that we can begin to do what Paul says in verse 1. To walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. And so you see what we're saying. When we are reminding ourselves of the grace that we have received in Christ, then these things that Paul calls us to here in the beginning of the chapter, they will much more easily flow. When we're remembering that Christ is everything, it's much more easy to, to walk humbly, to walk in lowliness. Christ, he became a servant. He humbled himself. And so how can I go about propping myself up and pretending that I'm enjoying Christ-centered communion. Or gentleness, Christ the gentle Savior. Christ the one who deals, deals tenderly with his people. Christ the one who, who calls his weak people, his, his believers who struggle to know themselves as, as in Christ. He calls them and he reaches out to them uh, through the preaching, through the sacraments to strengthen their faith. That is the Christ we follow and we're to imitate with all long suffering, how patient has God been with us this past week? Just think of the past seven days. The patience of God to deal with us as we naturally doubt him. Our father who, who has eternally loved us. When we rem remind ourselves what we have in Christ, then, then this patience, that fruit of patience can be born. And we can bear with one another in love. Well, this is where we must begin. We must begin by reminding ourselves about what we have in Christ. And we can't do that enough. We cannot do that enough. This is how we live daily life. I remind myself who I have or what I am in Christ and all that I have in him. And it's only after doing that that I can then busy myself in serving the body of Christ. And that's what we want to look at in our second point, the diversity of the saints. Often, we think our problems come from people being different than us. 
if only everyone was the same as me, we all would get along, and life would be easy. That's what we think. But that's wrong, because, uh, and and Paul shows us here how wrong that is, because notice after stating the great unity that the saints share in Christ in verses 1 through 6, Paul turns now in verses 7 to 16 to highlight the diversity of the saints, the differences among God's people. Notice especially verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So here Paul is saying that every member has received different gifts. They haven't received the same gifts, and they haven't received the same amount of gifts. But to each one of us, grace was given, particular grace, particular gifts were given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ was the one delegating who would get what gift and how much they would get. And so there is a beautiful diversity of flowers in God's garden. And the first thing we want to look at is the source of this diversity. That diversity is not a problem. It's not a bad thing. We don't want everyone to look the same because Christ is the source of this diversity. Each one of us, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. We are not the source of our differing strengths and gifts. Uh, There's nothing that we have done in ourselves to give ourselves the gifts that we have received This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 4, what do we have that we have not received? We have nothing. Everything we have has been given to us as a gift from the Lord. And Christ, he's the one who specifically gives gifts to the members of his church to serve the body of his, to serve the body. And so our gifts don't originate in us. They are Christ's gift to his people. And here's the point that we want to make that Christ is the source of these differing gifts and of this diversity, that means that Christ, he doesn't want uniformity. Christ doesn't make clones. Christ doesn't want replicas. But he intentionally makes his people different. Intentionally. On purpose. Uh, He gives different measures to his people uh, on purpose. And he does this so that we might need one another and also be needed in the church. Christ has intentionally designed his bride in this way. He doesn't want any of his people to think that they don't need others and that they're not needed. Both of those thoughts are wrong and sinful. We need others, and we and others need us to be invested as well. We can think of it like a basketball team. If they're if the whole team was made up of seven-foot centers driving the net, uh, there would be a problem. That team wouldn't win. But likewise, if the team was made up of five-foot-tall point guards staying at the three, three-point line, they also wouldn't win. Uh, they need this diversity. They need one another. The team, a winning team, is well-rounded. They need to have different talents. They need to have different skill sets. They need to be different sizes. They need to play different positions. And that's exactly how Christ has designed his church as well. He has purposely included this diversity into his church. Verse 7 has said that. Verse 11 also makes that point again. Notice, in Christ himself, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And so while Christ gifts every member, Every single Christian has gifts. He also has given as gifts to the church some individuals who hold a particular office. And again, that tells us of this diversity. Not everyone has the same function. Only some are are pastor and teacher, and only some are members. There's differences in the body of Christ. And again, Christ is behind this. This is Christ's way of, of building his church. Now, why does Christ do that? Well, we've been hinting at that, but that's the second thing. Notice the purpose for this diversity, the purpose. Uh, It's for the good of the church. Christ has given an assortment of gifts so that they might be used to serve the body of Christ. He says that 
Paul says that in verse 12. Christ gave these various offices for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And that word ministry there is literally translated service. Uh, For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. And the word, it really pictures a waiter serving at, at dinner tables. And so Christ, he, he doesn't give these, uh, these offices, these church leaders to do all the work of ministry, all the work of serving, but he gives them so that the saints might join them in their service, in their ministry. And so the purpose of the church leader is to help encourage and enable every member to use the gifts that Christ has particularly given to you as an individual. And what's the primary way, then, that the church leader is to do this? Well, look again at verse 11. Notice the various offices Christ has given. There's apostles, there's prophets, there's evangelists, there's pastors and teachers, and really pastors and teachers is one office, referring to the same thing. And while some of these offices have passed away with the early church, uh, apostles and prophets, notice how the ministry of the word is central to each one. The ministry of the word is central to each of these offices. So the apostles, they received the word from Christ and delivered it to the church. And the prophets, we often think of the prophets as merely predicting the future. But if you read the Old Testament, you notice that the prophets actually spend a lot more of their time preaching the word of God, that God has already given to his people and applying it to their lives. And so that's what the prophets would do. They would take the word and apply it to the church. And the evangelists are those who bring the word. They bring the gospel so that more might be added to the church. And then the pastors and teachers are ministers and teachers who are called to feed the sheep, to nourish God's people with the word. And so the point we're seeing is that it's through the ministry of the word that the church leaders build up, they equip the members for service. This is one major reason why we come, I hope, week after week to hear the preaching of the word. We come for this purpose because of this text. We we come as members, yes, to feed on Christ, to have our souls nourished. And if we're not a believer, we come to hear the gospel so we might be saved. But as believers, as members of Christ, we also come to be equipped, to be trained, to be taught, to be stretched to be convicted, to be prodded, to be pushed out into service. And so is that your prayer as you come to God's house? Do you pray, Lord, show me your glory? That that ought to be your prayer. Lord, show me yourself. But do you also pray, Lord, equip me. Make me more useful. Make me a sharper tool that you can use for the good of your church. And so equipping is one purpose that that God has given, that Christ has given to the church leaders. And flowing from that is edification. So equipping and edifying. Notice verse 12 goes on. They equip for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so this is why Christ has, has given the differing gifts to his saints, is that they might edify one another. That is, that they might build one another up. Uh, this word edify, it's, it's a construction term. You can picture uh, a bricklayer or, or a house builder. And, and Christ here, he has that imagery in mind. He has a major building project that he is working on. Uh, he is building his church. And in Ephesians 2, Paul has called his church a temple. The temple that God dwells in, that's Christ's building project. He is building his church. And as verse 10 says of chapter 4, this church is going to fill all things. Notice, Christ, he ascended into all the, far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so this is a massive building project that Christ has in view. It's one that spans the globe. He is building his church And he's doing so by drawing from all the nations of the world and the workers that he has commissioned to help him build this church, that he is equipped to build this church, are you and I the ordinary members of that body? 
Yes, we are, we are the grunt workers. We are the laborers. We're, we're carrying the bricks. We're laying in a pile. There are some who are stacking up the bricks. Uh, we're working together. And, and we need to work together to complete this task until the day when every single Christian, all the elect of God will be gathered in and Christ will dwell in our midst in this beautiful uh, edifice, this beautiful house that he has made. In 1882, uh, the Sagrada Familia, it's a cathedral that is in Barcelona. It began being built. Um, and that project, it has gone on for 139 years. And still to this day, it's not complete. If you were to go to Barcelona and visit this cathedral, they are still working on it. The workers are still constructing it. 139 years later, working on the same building project. And they think that in the next five years, they they hope to complete it. And yet, what has motivated them to continue this work year after year through both world wars, through all the crises that this world has seen since then, and yet they press on, they continue. The thing that's motivated them is, is the beauty of this building. The beauty that, that's, that this building represents, but also, uh, of course, in, in their theology, they think that this is pleasing unto God. And yet here we have Scripture telling us the real cathedral that Christ is building. Uh, it's not a physical building, but it's His church. And how can we press on in this work? Um, staying motivated as the thousands of years roll on and history continues the only way is to see the beauty of this building. Yes, we often see the, the dirt and, and the filth and the brokenness of Christ's church, but Christ wants us to see the beauty of what he is making and to know that he is receiving the glory through this project. Well, lastly then, we want to look at the practice. We've looked, uh, as we look at the diversity of the saints, we've, uh, we want to look now at the practice. How can we put these things into practice And here again, our catechism helps us. It says, secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. That's a point that we've been pressing home this whole sermon. Everyone must know it is his duty. It's not an option, but Christ has said it is our duty to readily and cheerfully employ our gifts to build this beautiful church of God. And so every believer, not some, not 20% of the people doing 80% of the work as most societies function, but everyone, it's, the duty, it's their duty to employ their gifts. Notice that. Uh, not to wish they had other gifts, Not to be envious of others, wishing that Christ had given them something different. Not squandering their gifts, not burying their talents, but employing them, using them, stewarding them. And and that word stewarding is helpful because at various seasons in our lives, we'll be more or less busy in in church-related activities. Uh, If we're a steward, we're we're thinking about longevity. How can I be useful in the long term? And there are seasons, there may be seasons when life is so busy or when God has put a certain providence on your, on your path that you cannot give more than you are currently giving. And in the, for the, the need to steward your own health, you may need to pull back with that long-term view and focus. I want to serve the church for years to come, Lord willing. And so I know when I'm burning out. And yet, on the other hand, we must be stewarding these gifts, taking, uh, the call is to employ these gifts, we're to put them to use, not for ourselves, but for Christ as we seek to serve others. And that's the primary call. Then are we using our gifts for the good of the church, or are they just being used on ourselves? Maybe you're wondering practically what your gifts are. That can be something we struggle with. And if that is your struggle, then I encourage you to pray, first of all, not so much, you, you can pray, Lord, show me what my gifting is, but pray more for a serving heart. Lord, give me a serving heart. Because as you pray for a serving heart, and as you have that heart that is inclined to service, 
then when opportunities come, you will see them and you'll take them. And it's normally in the, the, as you're working there in that setting, serving others, that your gifts become evident. It, it's hard to see the basketball player's talent when he's sitting on the sidelines. But when he goes onto the court, you start to see, wow, this is what he's capable of. And no, he, he shouldn't be the point guard. We see his gifts, but he shouldn't be in that position. And so we'll move him around. And the same thing happens in the church. When we busy ourselves in the church, maybe doing something that at first doesn't seem like a fit for us, yet others may see your gifts. You yourself might see your gifts and eventually find that place where you can serve. And maybe also a special note for our older members. You who once gave your energies and and were busy serving in the church, and, and we appreciate you for doing so. And yet now, maybe in recent years, you've been feeling more guilty even. I I wish I could do more. And and sometimes we hear things like, I I wish I could do more, but but all I can do now is pray. And and, and when I hear that, I want to say, that's not a small thing you're doing. That is a huge load that you are lifting as you pray for the church as you are forced maybe to, to step back from other areas and now to, to give yourself to pray, that is a major necessary work that is fueling the energy for this building project. And so pray and continue to pray as we'll also hear this afternoon. Well, let me close by bringing to mind two types of gifts. And I have wedding gifts in mind. You know, I think you know both of these types of wedding gifts. Uh, The first is that wedding gift that you receive that you say thank you for, but it sits unopened in its box, and it just moves with you from house to house. You don't unpack it, never used. Are you really thankful for that gift? You might as well donate it so someone else can use it. But then there's another gift. It's that well-worn gift. It's that gift when you go to someone's house and and you see the old crockpot that's hardly functioning anymore, and it's been going 30 years strong, a wedding gift that they received, and it's been feeding the family and others for decades. That's a well-used and well-appreciated gift. What kind of gift do you think Christ wants us to have in terms of what he has given to us? Does he want that closed box or the well-worn crockpot? While may we match our confession of believing in the communion of the saints by growing up in all things into him who is the head, Christ himself, from whom the whole body, joint and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Amen.